One Saturday morning in 2015, I sat down at my dinner table with a bunch of old surgical instruments and a dead blackbird. And while I looked at that precious little body laying on a paper towel, before I could even make that first incision, I wondered, was this a good idea? I mean, I was a veterinary nurse. What was I thinking? How could taxidermy and animal welfare actually go hand in hand? But this didn't stop me. I was intrigued by taxidermy and the whole process of skinning an animal and preserving it to make a piece of taxidermy. Even though my day job at the time was to care for the living. You see, as it turns out, right, stay with me here, taxidermy and veterinary nursing actually have things in common. As a taxidermist, I see the injuries that many wild animals have sustained leading to their death, and I repair those injuries. The main difference now is that the animals on my table have already died, and instead of sending pets home with their parents, I'm sending out preserved animals into the world so that they can go on to educate the public about native wildlife. So on that first Saturday morning, I learnt a lot about myself. Like, I really, really need to eat breakfast before I skin anything. But more importantly, I learned that I needed to do some research to find out if there were other people out there like me. Had they found the link between taxidermy and animal welfare? And would this be something that I could work on in my own art practice? Because as someone whose masters and honours supervisors were both vegan, I was feeling a little sceptical. I needed to know if there were people out there who had found that link between animal welfare and taxidermy and if they'd also felt a little bit weird about their increasing collection of dead birds in their freezers. And I also started to think about what other animals would be okay to taxidermy. What was I okay working on? Would I ever be brave enough to taxidermy a wild cat or someone's pet? I wanted to know if answering these questions was going to help me come to terms with my new hobby. And the good news is that later on that afternoon, I found out that I wasn't on my own. As it turns out, having a collection of dead birds in your freezer, for some people, is a thing. So fast forward a few years, and I find myself teaching taxidermy to students who had wondered the same thing about themselves. And now I get to talk to them about ethical taxidermy, or taxidermists like me who go by a no-kill, no-waste philosophy. So that's working on animals that have been hit by cars or birds that have flown into windows or animals who have been culled in pest control measures or wildlife that just couldn't be rehabilitated due to the extent of their injury or disease. So what you would find in your local vet clinic freezer. Some of these taxidermists will only work on animals that have been in captivity their whole lives so that their absence has no impact whatsoever on the local biodiversity. Now, this humane sourcing of animals was something that had never been associated with taxidermy before, and it also paired with the green movement due to its recycling aspect, not to mention burying the remains is a great way to feed the dirt. So that first afternoon, I felt like I was on a roll with my research. Had I found a way to put animal welfare and taxidermy under the same umbrella? I mean, how ethical taxidermists define what is okay to taxidermy also depends on where they live and the legalities around collecting those specimens. And that put me in a unique position. Given that New Zealand's goal is to become predator-free by 2050 to enable our native wildlife to thrive meant that I had a pretty good variety of species to work on. But then came along the trolleyology scenario. And by that, I don't mean checking out what's in someone's supermarket trolley. I'm talking about the thought experiment where a runaway train is on course to collide and kill a number of people, but the driver or a bystander can intervene and divert that vehicle to kill just one person, but they're on a tra different track. How did I feel about sacrificing one animal to save others though. 
and I'm not talking about who to run over with my own car. I'm talking about using trapped predator species to taxidermy. As Kiwis, we have a collective responsibility to protect our native biodiversity. And as someone looking at a piece of taxidermy, we need to ask ourselves, why and for whom has this particular creature been preserved for? What ideology or aesthetic craving does it satisfy? Well, what I can say is there's nothing quite like using a super cute taxidermy collection of predator species to show people just how well designed these animals are for killing their prey. I mean, who could resist the sweet face of a ferret or a stoat? But then again, I guess that depends on if you're the bird with only one wing now. Working with trapping communities like Ofonga Alive to collect specimens for taxidermy and for my students to use has meant that these animals that would otherwise have been discarded are instead being recycled for educational purposes. And my students love working on them most of the time. T to be honest though, they don't love the mustelid scent gland so much. They're these two little glands on either side of their butt and they smell like they smell like freshly poured tar seal on a baking hot summer day, except way, way stinkier. But on the upside, they all got to learn about the anatomy of this animal. Nine people this weekend got to learn about this stoat's treasures and they got to see how well he was designed to kill prey. And bonus, I had made sure that every single one of them had eaten breakfast before they arrived. On a serious note though, New Zealand has the highest rate of threatened native species in the world. Our native animals were completely unprepared for the introduction of these predator species. And we need to restore our unique ecosystem so that our endemic species can flourish and thrive again. And talking to these members of the trapping communities had meant that I had started to feel a little bit better about my trolleyology bump in the road. By recycling these predator species, I could create a platform to educate more people about how our native wildlife are facing these issues as prey. We can learn so much from taxidermy. For example, researchers will use museum study skin collections to find out about how a specific environmental event or change has impacted a specific species or the evolution of another. And we can also look to taxidermy to find out about extinct species and reflect on sustainable collecting practices. Unfortunately for the huia, they are a good example of this. Huia were a native bird. They were mostly all black, except for the white tips at the end of their tails and their little orange wattles. And they were collected for research and for taxidermy and adornments and then exported around the world. As demand for these birds rose and more predator species established themselves in New Zealand, the huia population began to decline. And even though we tried to protect these birds starting in the late 1880s, by the time they were added to the Animal Protection Act in 1892, the huia population were unable to recover. And they were last seen in 1907. Unless, of course, you find them in a museum or in an educational collection somewhere. This same legislation is now known as the Wildlife Act 1953 and it continues to protect our remaining native species. It's also used by all taxidermists in New Zealand because each native animal protected by this act must be accompanied by a Department of Conservation permit before it can be collected and worked on. So we can use the story of the huia to reflect on the importance of our native birds to our unique biodiversity in New Zealand and also find ways to protect them before it's too late. Our ideas about taxidermy are changing because it's becoming more and more well known that that historical stereotype of the camo clad hunter usually visualized as a middle-aged man with walls covered in hunting trophies that you assume killed for sport or maybe specifically to hang on their walls are no longer the only ones making taxidermy. There's actually a diverse group of taxidermists around the world who are gaining momentum in the public eye, including some middle-aged men who wear camo. And we're all talking about our relationship to our local environments and our passion for conservation.
historical attitudes towards specimen collecting are also changing. And while we may only wear fur because it's a family heirloom or maybe it's vintage, new taxidermy pieces are also subject to the same scrutiny. People are asking, where did that animal come from? They want to know more about that individual before they add it to their collection at home. Being able to reflect on the historical impact of specimen collecting means that we'll be in a better position in the future to protect our wildlife. And through these conversations, we're seeing those old stereotypes that have haunted the practice shifting, no longer stunting the growth of the conservation side of taxidermy. But what about taxidermy and art? How does that work when, say, I taxidermy a wild hare that has been hit by a car on a suburban street and then I put that taxidermy hare into an old coffee sack and exhibit it in an art gallery? The truth is, choosing to become a full-time taxidermist was the best decision I ever made. I love being able to create a taxidermy mount using the story that was given to me with the animal. And I love being able to open up a dialogue about the relationship that we have with animals and being able to shift the perspective of someone who walks into an art gallery is one of the best things about what I do. This is because you see, it's not just the animals that we keep as pets we should care about. So next time you're in a museum or in an art gallery and you find yourself looking at a piece of taxidermy, have a think about what has made you stop and study that pose or that facial expression, all those feathers. What are you learning about this animal and what are you learning about yourself? Because dissecting these aspects of taxidermy could lead you into a whole new world of biodiversity appreciation and how you think animals should be collected for taxidermy. Thank you.